Hey guys, welcome back. With my Deleted series being one of the most successful on my channel across the board, whether talking about items, abilities, champions even, I wanted to do one on removed runes and masteries. In fact, one of the first videos I made that did really well once my channel took off that wasn't a why no one plays video was actually on a specific rune, Prototype Omnistone. The runes and mastery system has undergone a lot of changes, reaching a point where masteries no longer exist and have been consolidated into runes as of Season 8. But even then, runes have been changed around, added in, taken out, etc. Because it's been made evidently clear that milking nostalgia for all it's worth not only is a ton of fun but is enjoyed by many of you, let's go ahead and talk about removed runes and masteries for today. Specifically Keystone Masteries by the way. If you take a look at the most recent iteration of this system before it was phased out, I'm referring to the ones at the bottom since those actually shape a champion's gameplay, whereas all the masteries above it consist of primarily minute stat adjustments. Speaking of runes and masteries, how would you like to have an easy way to know what your optimal runes are? Then I'd like to offer you Poral Fester. Haven't been sponsored by these guys in a while but it's great to have them again. Portal Fester is a companion app that runs on Overwolf, supplying you with all sorts of helpful information from champion builds to statistics, win rates, counter tips, etc. right from champion select. In addition, they give you an in-game stat tracker to let you know how good your CS per minute is, plus vision, how good's your income per minute, and kill participation among other things. It's a very handy companion app that's completely safe and complies with Riot's terms of service. Just download the Overwolf app in Portal Fester and it should automatically pop up every time you load your league client. By now, most of you should already know what Portal Fester is, but for those who don't, I highly recommend it for your convenience, especially if you're serious about climbing. Use my link in the description below. Thanks again to Overwolf for sponsoring the video, good to have you again, but for now, back to talking about some old runes and masteries. First one I want to talk about is Warlord's Bloodlust. Bloodlust went through a number of variants before it was finalized and then taken out. Following runes reforged, it has since been renamed Tiffly Footwork, where every so often you would heal a small amount of health and gain bonus movement speed on your next auto attack. But there were two other versions of the mastery that were pretty interesting for different reasons. The first was the original, when it first got introduced in Season 6. Critical Strikes would heal you for 15% of the damage dealt and grant 20% bonus attack speed for 4 seconds. So basically, you had 15% lifesteal on crit strikes. Very simple premise and one that was intended to realize its value towards the mid to late game as marksmen accumulated more crit chance with each item. Considering it was attached to a very particular stat that was exclusive to a particular build path, it seemed appropriate to give a fairly decent amount of lifesteal and attack speed. There was, uh, just one problem. Two champions existed that kind of made this rune overpowered, Yasuo and Trindamir. Trindamir could artificially acquire crit chance through Fury generation, while Yasuo only needed to build two items for 100% crit chance, allowing both of them to realize the full value of this mastery far earlier than anyone else. If it were just that, I don't think it would have been cause for concern to rework the entire thing, but another issue was that Bloodlust was practically a dead rune for other champions for the first 20 minutes of the game, since they have no crit chance, making this rune pretty much only viable on Trindamir and Yasuo. So they changed it a few months later, making it so you would gain increased lifesteal based on your missing health. That way, it would be more usable by everyone. To ensure it doesn't replace the need to build actual lifesteal, they made it so you would only really heal a lot when close to the point of death, and severely reduced its effectiveness when attacking non-champions. I enjoyed this mastery a lot, even though I don't play ADC. The balance dynamic between lifesteal and damage was always that if you wanted DPS, you trade survivability and vice versa. If you took Bloodlust, you couldn't take forever of battle, so it was better for survival. Personally, I find Fleet Full Work to be terribly designed, as it lets most champions basically recover to full HP if given adequate time, whereas this version only let you recover up to, I would say, half HP. So it was kind of like Warwick Passive, where you would only heal on autos if sufficiently injured. It was a cool mastery, I would rather have this be Fleet Full Work than Fleet's current function. Next mastery will be Deathfire Touch, not to be confused with the item Deathfire Grasp, those are two different things. Now, I can perfectly understand why Deathfire Touch was taken out. It was a very uninteractive mastery with almost no semblance of skill expression. It was supposed to be the counterpart to Thunderlord's Decree, otherwise now known as Electrocute, with Thunderlords offering a serious boost in damage for short burst trades and Deathfire excelling in prolonged fights through attrition. You can think of it almost like Leandre's Torment or Demonic Embrace, where damaging abilities would deal damage over time for 4 seconds. This was obviously intended for champions with heavy poke or persistent damage, Malzahar, Bran, Zyra, etc basically anyone who could build Leandris, but sometimes you could see this on a few ADCs like Misfortune or Varus who weren't really fast attackers, more lane bully neutral poke champions. But what I mostly remember this mastery for is the unique synergy it had with Jin. With its comparably slower rate of fire in tandem with having a reload ammo system, Jin wasn't all that compatible with Fervor of Battle or Warlord's Bloodlust. However, with this measurably higher AD scaling, easily reaching 600 plus in the mid to late game, whereas Marksman usually had only maybe 250 or 300 around the same point, Deathfire Touch would deal a ton of damage with every proc, making it very likely for you to lose a good chunk of your health from just the mastery, let alone Jin's actual damage. It was a very straightforward mastery otherwise, and again, not the most interactive one out there. Still though, I think it worked rather nicely with certain champions. Since then, it's been superseded by the Rune Scorch. Moving on, let's go over Courage of the Colossus. This mastery was phased out for Aftershock, which is a very similar idea. 
If you apply any hard crowd control to a target, you get a shield for every nearby enemy champion. Courage was preceded by Strength of the Ages, but I think this one's a bit more noteworthy. Strength of the Ages was a pretty bland mastery all things considered. Just by looking at it, you can kind of guess the champions who want to use this. Nautilus, Leona, Alistar, you know, anyone who would go smack dab in the middle of the enemy team. Surprisingly, this and by extension Aftershock isn't a good choice for Malphite on account of him having no way to proc it outside of his ultimate, despite looking like it would be perfect for him. The main difference between Courage and Aftershock, apart from the type of defense, is that Aftershock has a small explosion accompanying it. But I guess for the sake of comparison, we can retroactively move that explosion to Courage. So why did they change it from a shield to bonus armor and magic assist? I'm not entirely sure. Technically, Aftershock has more potential to be weaponized as a lot of tanks can scale off armor and magic assist, but generally, I don't recall there being a single tank with those ratios in question that takes Aftershock. For instance, Orin doesn't go Aftershock, neither does Malphite. Galio is basically the only one who goes Aftershock, but I mean he's more of a bruiser than a full-on tank. I think they changed it from a shield to armor and magic assist because shields are more universally applicable and also tougher to counter. Against Aftershock, at least you can still use true damage or armor and magic penetration to fight through it, whereas there's no counterplay against a shield, especially back then. Remember, Serpent's Fang and shield busting properties on Renekton and Rel weren't a thing at that time. Plus, health is naturally more accessible in this game, so maybe they chose armor and magic assist to prevent diver champs like Xinjiao from accessing it with the idea that it's only intended for tanks. Although ironically, Aftershock used to have AD and AP ratios, meaning champions like Lissandra would sometimes take it, so I don't know what to think. For the next one, we're going to talk about some runes, three of them to be exact. Everyone knows about bone plating as that anti-burst, anti-trade defensive rune, but that was actually the third rune to be in that spot. Prior to bone plating, there was chrysalis, where you would gain free bonus health, which would then convert into bonus attack damage or ability power depending on which one you have more of after scoring four kill participation. As the name implies, it was a good rune for champions who wanted to play safe in the early game before power spiking mid to late game. It was a basic premise that very clearly expressed what it was trying to do. What made them switch it for bone plating was the same reason they removed Deathfire Touch. It wasn't a badly designed rune, it just wasn't a good one either. No matter how you interpret it, it was just extra stats. There was a condition that had to be met to get the full value from Chrysalis, but bone plating definitely had a more defined characteristic and niche. Prior to Chrysalis though were Iron Skin and Mirror Shell, runes with identical functions just for different stats. Passively you would gain bonus armor or magic resist, and then get a 5% bonus for 3 seconds whenever you heal for at least 20, consume a potion or biscuit, or gain a shield. Both of them have since been replaced by Shield Bash, but the idea was that if you had easy access to heals or shields, you would get some extra defensive stats. This was especially effective on champions with passive shields like Rakan, Malphite, or anyone who persistently recovered like Mundo, Vladimir Zak, or if you had Bloodthirster shield back in the day, or the Overheal rune. Unlike Chrysalis, which was too generic and too usable by everyone, Iron Skin and Mirror Shell were too specific, only efficient on like half a dozen champions of that, so they both got taken out. Ultimately, I think Bone Plating and Shield Bash came out better, but it was a worthwhile attempt at making defensive runes for a certain niche. Okay, let's talk about an old keystone rune, Kleptomancy. Ah yes, the most colorful rune in the game, and I don't mean that as a compliment. I talked about Kleptomancy before, but I feel like it has to be included in this video for the sake of posterity. That applies to Avni Stone too, but I made a full dedicated video on that one. To be honest with you, I have no idea what this rune was trying to pull off. I know what it did, but I didn't know what it was for. The point of a keystone rune is to adhere towards a playstyle. Conqueror and Lethal Tempo are good for extended fights, Face Rush is good for hit and runs, Glacial Augment for inhibiting enemy tempo, stuff like that. But Kleptomancy just… it doesn't really fit into any kind of playstyle. After using an ability, your next two basic attacks give you bonus gold and a chance at acquiring a random item. They can be wards, bags of gold, consumables, stat potions, or in rare occasions, a free skill level up. Because of its all-purpose utility, Kleptomancy became the rune you would take if you couldn't take anything else, or if you were someone who could easily get off on hit abilities and autos. Champions in need of crucial early game power spikes would also take this rune. But that was the thing. It could theoretically be taken by anyone who used equal parts abilities and auto attacks like Ezreal, Gangplank, Fiora, and so on. And those champions coincidentally happened to have fantastic 2-item power spikes. Through Klepto, you could easily rack up 5 to 600 extra gold in 15 to 20 minutes, at the expense of forfeiting a combat rune. That is, unless you manage to pull travel size elixirs to boost your stats temporarily. There's been some discussion over whether Kleptomancy was a more degenerate rune or if First Strike is worse. When First Strike was introduced, everyone was like, oh boy, Kleptomancy 2.0, anyone with poke tools will run it for extra gold. But the difference between them is that Kleptomancy was better for anyone with the neutral game, while First Strike was good for champions with burst trades or good advantage states. Ironically, First Strike has an even faster gold accumulation rate than Klepto on average, especially on melee champions or anyone with point and click. Silas, Nafiri, Kiana, Talon, Karthus, Fiddlesticks, a single rotation of their abilities in the mid to late game would net them an extra 200 plus gold off one proc of First Strike. So while Klepto's value depreciated over time, First Strike's value matured over time. 
But going back to the original question of which one is healthier, I prefer to say neither of them are healthy, but Klepto's problem was that it encouraged a non-confrontational playstyle. The notion of accumulating gold through kills is that by putting yourself at risk, you can achieve greater reward. Kills net you income at a faster rate than simply farming minions, but through Klepto, you could acquire gold and skill faster without having to risk your life trying to kill your opponent. In fact, sometimes it would even be better than kills, since it was almost guaranteed. The only thing that makes First Strike not as bad as Klepto is that First Strike actually has counterplay. If you damage your opponent before they get a chance to go in against you, they not only lose their free gold, but also the bonus true damage that comes with it. Against Kleptomancy, you can't really do anything to stop them. I mean, I guess you can kill them, but that's how you shut down anyone. Realistically, there's no way you can prevent a Fiora, Gangplank, Ezreal, whoever from Q-spamming on you and racking up literal hundreds of gold in value, tons of potions, tons of wards, maybe some extra combat stats, or like I mentioned before, those pivotal skill point elixirs getting you to those crucial power spikes that much faster. I don't think I have to elaborate any further on why a rune that encourages you to not actively engage with your lane opponent is a terrible rune. Not even counting the fact that it legitimately has no purpose. At the very least, First Strike has a purpose. It's electrocute, but instead of dealing a big chunk of damage, it gives you extra gold. I mean, the true damage bonus is nice, but I still think electrocute does more, especially since against a ranged champion, attacking with First Strike as a melee is easier said than done. Next room we're going to talk about is Ultimate Hat, which I think used to be in place of Nimbus Cloak alongside Mana Flow Band and Nullifying Orb. Ultimate Hat's purpose, if it wasn't obvious, is that it lowers your ultimate cooldown by 5%, increased by 2% every time you cast it, capped at 15% after 5 casts. And since it's stacked multiplicatively with cooldown reduction, it would give you 49% CDR or 53.25 with Cosmic Insight back when that rune increased your CDR cap to 45%. Since then, it's been replaced by Ultimate Hunter and the Domination Tree. The key difference is that Ultimate Hat gave you permanent CDR merely for using your ultimate, although Hunter would give you more overall cooldown reduction if memory serves. Here's the thing. Because it only required successive uses to lower cooldown, you would occasionally see transformers like Jace take it as he would quickly be able to use it 5 times and thus allow for faster switches between his ranged and melee forms. One of the big counter matchup tips against Jace is that when he switches from hammer to cannon, you have 6 seconds to attack him without worrying about getting knocked away. Although given he's a routine user of Muramana, most Jace players would go mana full band instead. And with how easy of an activation requirement this was, casted and players loved ultimate hat. Naturally though, getting free ultimate cooldowns by just pressing the R button doesn't make for very engaging interactions, so they wanted to add more skill expression to the rune by making it a bounty hunter version in the form of Ultimate Hunter. By this point, you can kind of guess the balance team's thought process on runes. They want them to be easy to access by a lot of champions without necessarily being free stats. That's why you have runes like Water Walking, which give great bonuses, but only when in a certain part of the map, or First Strike having the opportunity for big sums of gold, but only if you can, true to its name, land the First Strike. I mean, these aren't the most arduous activation conditions out there, but point being, the player has to actively do something to acquire said bonus. Bringing us to our last item of the list. Celestial Body, short, sweet, and to the point. You get 100 bonus health for free. In exchange, you deal 10% less damage to enemy champions and monsters. This was one of the laziest design runes in the game that I don't think anyone actually used except supports, like ever, because it was replaced by Time Warp Tonic, which actually had a use. In fact, it had a ton of use. I know we have runes like Conditioning or Magical Footwear that essentially do the exact same thing, but those don't really come with the negative effect of dealing less damage. Yes, Celestial Body gives your bonuses up front, but the Inspiration Tree especially comes with so many other unique choices that you would go for before we so much as thought about this one. It was such a boring rune, something you would see in 2013, way back in the day. The evolution of runes and masteries gets less attention compared to items and champions, but it was still something worth exploring anyway. To be honest, I kind of miss the old runes and masteries back when they were separate, mostly because I was a passionate supporter of the 1% crit rune. Hashtag RNG. But what do you guys think? Do you believe any of these old runes and masteries can be brought back to the game, or do you like how things are now? Let me know in the comments down below. For now, if you enjoyed the video, I encourage you to leave a like and subscribe. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter at VarsVam, join my Discord server, and check out my other videos on removed items and abilities if you haven't yet. Until next time, thanks so much for watching, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Take care.